welcome to the House Education Committee. Um, this morning we have uh, Secretary French who will be addressing us on some very important items and uh, we'll be joined later um, by our chair, um, Representative Webb, and hopefully uh, Representative Conlon will be joining us as well. Um, so Secretary French, we have some couple of questions for you that um, people have a great interest in. And one of them, that if, if you can address the literacy strategy under Act 173, um, that would be the first item. And second um, would be a response to the anticipated literacy laws. Um, and third, we certainly are very interested in school reopening how we're gonna proceed and how have we proceeded with that to this date. So you have the floor, Secretary. Yeah, good morning, it's good to see you all. Hope you're all Hi. doing well. The, um, yeah, certainly uh, take the issues almost, I guess, starting with the last one first, the uh, reopening has been the focus of our work uh, greater than literacy and other aspects of previous uh, reforms, including Act 173. So I think you're aware um, we issued joint guidance last week with the Department of Health on essentially the, the public health guidance that would inform reopening of schools. Uh, and we see that guidance as being um, more or less the cornerstone of uh, the guidance that will inform how we reopen schools in the fall. The uh, items we're working on around that, uh, firstly, the um, one issue that's emerged right off is the issue of what we're calling hybrid instruction, the ability to offer a district to offer simultaneously uh, in-person instruction and remote learning. So we're investigating um, our ability to uh, provide guidance on hybrid instruction. Uh, we think on the one hand, it would be very useful to have in our toolkit in terms of navigating what no doubt will be a very dynamic situation in the fall. Um, on the other hand, we're concerned about attendance issues and some of the regulatory aspects of compulsory education. So we're, we are reviewing that um, and I expect to, uh, you know, engage with our stakeholder groups uh, on that very, very shortly um, to examine to what extent we might wanna provide that. Um, Another aspect of a sort of related note is the issue, I think, of decision making, uh, because we have, as you know, a um, sort of decentralized school system to a certain extent with local control at the district level. Um, I think the, the guidance, uh, I would argue, is exceedingly well done in terms of uh, striking a balance between what, what are requirements from a public health perspective and what are recommendations. Uh, but I think we need to get more clear in our partnership with school districts about what you know what role school boards in particular are going to play in some of the decision making around um, implementing that guidance so that's something uh, we're working on um, i have a meeting i believe next week with the school board associations to be talking about some of those issues um, i think in terms of uh, implementing the guidance uh, had a discussion last night with the executive a group from Vermont EDA that's been working on their own uh, sort of guidance uh, on reopening schools. So we're spending some time talking about um, getting a group of practitioners together around implementing the guidance so that we can uh, help, let's say, differentiate the guidance into specific instructional areas. For example, how would the guidance apply in the context of uh, choral instruction versus CTE programs and so forth. So I think there's going to be a need to uh, bring together practitioners uh, around specific areas of implementing the guidance. So anyway, I'd, I'd be happy to talk about the reopening in greater detail, but uh, the point, I, the reason I start with that is that it certainly has been the focus of our work. And uh, as much as we previously had 173 on the front burner, uh, that's been more or less, uh, I think, pushed to the back burner. However, um, one of the issues related to reopening and one of the uh, I'll say motivators in, in desiring to reopen has to do with our, our interest in uh, beginning to assess the impact of COVID-19 on student learning. And we acknowledge that really to, to start to do that, we need to reopen schools. So that brings, that brings into focus uh, much of the work of Act 173 in terms of um, 
really, really getting from a systems perspective at the school districts to talk about a, a comprehensive educational support team, you know, how we're going to wrap supports around students, particularly uh, if we contemplate this hybrid model, um, how are we going to provision supports for students if they're learning online or or transitioning from online back to in-person and so forth. And that, that kind of movement or fluctuation in the routines of schools will be very, no doubt, very disruptive uh, to those students who are more vulnerable to that disruption. So I think we have a lot of work to do on um, understanding and provisioning support systems for students in, in the fall. So I think that's that's where a lot of the work under 173 comes back into focus pretty quickly because we were, if you remember, our focus from the agency was on sort of reinvigorating a conversation on four, I would say, essential elements from a school district perspective, having a coordinated curriculum, having a needs-based professional development system, uh, a local assessment plan, and then a, a robust educational support system for students. Those are four things that are in regulation for, for quite some time and we think should be reinvigorated under 173. I think in particular in the light of COVID, uh, that still remains true. And uh, we're, we're gonna have to, to uh, put some effort on particularly um, energizing the student support systems in the context of the sort of fluctuation, if you will, from instructional dispositions of schools and school districts. Mm -hmm. In terms of literacy reform, uh, we think that's still an essential element. Uh, that's why we were interested in introducing language at the beginning of the session around that, um, you know, because so much of in the research behind 173 points the need to focus on literacy in Vermont. Um, our efforts on that right now are really around securing additional federal money. There's a special ed leadership grant in particular that we've applied for. Uh, Vermont routinely uh, receives that grant. Uh, but we intend to focus those funds on building leadership literacy development um, among curriculum directors and teachers uh, to basically enact uh, those system reforms that we were interested in doing in 173. I will say on a related note, uh, we are also able to launch our partnership with Metametrics. This was the Lexile Quantile conversation. Uh, you might remember that um, we did proceed with that. Uh, there was a joint press release uh, last week, I believe, with uh, Vermont and Connecticut both announced their partnership with Metametrics. So I think, you know, once again, as we go into the fall and begin to assess the impact of COVID on student learning, uh, there's going to be a need to get some data around that. And I think Lexile Quantile sort of standard uh, provides a, perhaps a useful way for us to start to gather that at the state level, uh, since we won't, won't have SBAC online probably till a while. So why don't I stop there and be happy to talk more specifically about your questions you might have. I think in, in some of the conversations that we've had in the past few days, um, and there's been a lot of concern about kids coming back to school um, and the need for additional uh, instruction, perhaps even as we discussed, um, bringing in retired teachers, for example, to help out in classrooms and try and bring these children, students back up to their learning levels. Um, is that, has that been discussed um, or is that something that will be discussed perhaps with the, um, with some of your meetings that you're looking forward to here? Yeah, I think it'll come up. I mean, I was struck last night and I said to the group as much, uh, this is the, the core group of Vermont NEA's leadership team that's been working on um, internally working on their approach to reopening schools. And one of the things that um, struck home for me in that conversation as a former principal, you know, is the idea that um, we need to really reopen schools with the idea of addressing the social emotional supports for students first. I mean, we say that a lot. Yeah. But I was I was struck by um, which I had sort of sort of tacitly acknowledged in my own thinking if I were reopening school as a principal, based on what's happened, I would want to run my building for a couple months just to get the routines going because I think just the fact that the routines themselves are significant in the lives of students um, that in itself will help students get back on track. So the message from a lot of the teachers last night well let's not get right back to standards-based testing and going in heavy, hot and heavy on assessing impact on student learning right off. I think 
and I agree. I think I just sort of assume people would take a sort of a gradual celebratory approach to starting the new school year. I think that's sort of how you begin the year in most cases anyway. Uh, but particularly in this situation, um, I think, you know, we need to focus on getting the routines back on the line first. And really, I'm not really sure, and I don't think any educators really are, uh, about what the impact to date on students um, on COVID-19. So it's hard to understand what that impact will look like from an emotional and social standpoint until we get them back together in that environment. I think there'll be a lot of initial excitement about being back at school. I can imagine that. But I also think very quickly right behind that is the anxieties, um, the concerns, you know, the, the parents without jobs or, you know, all those kinds of things are going to come home uh, to roost pretty quickly uh, inside the school environment. So I think we want to be very cautious about coming in really, really strongly right off on day one to think that job one is assessing the impact, the academic impact of the emergency because the emergency is not over either. So, you know, um, I think I think as much as possible, um, we need to communicate. I need to communicate that you know goal goal one for the fall is just to reintroduce the the structure and routines of schools to families and students that they've counted on uh, for stability in their lives. And we need to be able to try to do that as goal number one. Once we get that established, I think yes, absolutely, we'll start to ascertain the impact of the emergency and begin to think about. How to do that assessment or how to deploy additional support services, but I would agree um, there's no doubt going to be the need for additional support services, um, but I think it would be premature to start stacking those up right now, and I actually would think it would might even cause greater anxiety to start to, to go in initially with that disposition. I think we need to be prepare, preparing for it and listening very closely and paying attention a lot to the dynamics in the school buildings, but this is unprecedented charted uh, territory and I, I would just, um, I, I think I'm going to be messaging, messaging more about let's goal one is just to open schools safely and let's try to establish the routines in the lives of students and families. And then as we get into that matter of weeks, perhaps end of September, we'll start to understand a little bit um, about provisioning additional supports. But um, it's also, I would qualify that to say, um, it's hard to predict what the public health conditions will be in September as well. So, you know, we, we're making these assumptions based on what we know right now and what we see, you know, what we think we see going forward. But, um, you know, it's clear what's going on in the South and out West and other part, other states that, you know, uh, we, we have to be very vigilant in maintaining a disciplined approach on the public health aspect as well. So it's hard, it's hard to, I guess, project. And I would just underscore the fact the emergency is not over. So we have to be very, very aware of that. Thank you. Uh, Representative Austin, you have a question? Yep. Um, thank you, uh, Secretary French. Sounds like a good plan. Um, I'm just wondering, because again, uh, being a former educator, I was certified as a principal, but I decided never to become one. Um, but I, I've, I've been thinking about if I was a principal, you know, what I would be doing now. And what I'd be doing now, like July 1st, I would be talking to the teachers in my school and asking them for the five top kids that they're most worried about in terms of being at risk, you know, in terms of that they were, way, you know, they had huge gaps, you know, when COVID hit. And I'd be, July 1st, I'd be, seeing if I could use the CRF funds to hire screeners or assessors. And I'd be inviting students, you know, I, I think Dr. Geller, I mean, I feel like she could come up with any kind of screening tool at all. I mean, if you just asked her, but I'd be asking, inviting parents of those students to be coming in July 1st or, you know, July 7th and just, you know, asking, just doing a quick, simple screening you know, to try to assess where they are um, in terms of their gaps in learning. So in September, you know, it'd be, it'd be them coming to school, you know, hopefully again, beginning that little transition um, back into the building, maybe one classroom that's all cleaned up. I don't want to go on and on with this, but <laughs> I, you know, I just, I feel like they've lost six months now, you know, and the most neediest kids, you know, as we know from, um, you know, we just know that they've probably, all kids have probably regressed a bit, 
But those kids, our, our minority students, our poverty students, have probably already regressed even more so than they may have before COVID. And I'm just wondering if throughout the summer, if you could just find a way to invite these students, identified students into just, you don't need to answer now, but it's just a thought. You have two months now to maybe like look at the most, you know, um, at risk students so that on September, at least they're receiving teacher, maybe the teacher that didn't know them that well, because they're all probably moving on to a new classroom, could begin to kind of at least focus on them and keep an eye on their learning. Because I, I think the way we know if a student is having any issues, emotional or learning, is when we instruct them and um, how it impacts their learning. You know, always if it impacts their learnings, we would look we'd start asking questions, um, but- Great statement, <laughs> great so, statement. Yeah, so, I, you know, I agree, you know, we have to be concerned about the emotional. And again, I've been looking for any data. I've, I've read articles on the mental health recovery of children in much bigger, you know, much more like volcanoes or earthquakes yeah. or gun, you know, school shootings. Um, you know, and the jury's really out on even what kind of intervention you would use, let alone in this situation where uh, we have no data. Um, so, I, I, you know, my, I just am hoping we can try to get back into learning and through that, like you said, not like be very intense, but just through that learning, then begin to identify who is not you know, progressing and who is, and then get them the help, you know, the support they need. But um, I just, I, I think what's most important for our children is to get back, like you said, into a routine, working with their teachers, a structure and, and get back to, um, you know, learning. So, yeah, I would that's, say, that, that's I my, guess, you know, to, to do a riff on your theme, I would say <laughs> reopening school itself is an intervention, you know, so yes, absolutely. We, we, right. So absolutely. we look at, we assume that, you know, schools open and as interventions are on top of that. At this point, the fact of opening the school itself becomes the biggest intervention we can do. Yeah. So um, you make some good points about the summer and I'm sure districts will work on that. I would say, you know, once again, I use the word district that hopefully uh, principals won't be doing that on their own with their teachers, that they'd be working as part of a school district system mm -hmm. uh, to prioritize those supports across all the schools in a school district. So hopefully the central office resources and that sort of triage or prioritization should occur. Yeah. Um, but I also expect that um, the health guidance, once again, we see as sort of the cornerstone of a lot of the work to about to happen that there's only gonna be so much oxygen in the room per se. And I think no doubt there will be aspects of school districts uh, focused on that and will certainly be focused. Uh, we have an element inside the agency that'll be focused on that sort of the intervention the continuity of learning. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of the district focus is gonna be just on reopening school. And once yeah. again, primary intervention. And um, people are gonna be reading that guidance very closely um trying to figure out how to enact that on a classroom by classroom basis on a school by school basis school buses school nurse offices you know uh, protective equipment hand sanitizer disinfection routines there's a lot of moving parts there yeah. um and as particularly you know i was the principal of a k-12 through school we didn't have i didn't have many other people in an administrative role to run a building of 300 students. And that's that's kind of the conditions for most of our principals. They wear lots of hats. So um, yeah. if I worry <clears throat> that if on a school by school basis, they're picking up that guidance on their own, um, it's gonna be challenging. They're gonna have to work closely as a group, as a group yeah. of schools no. in a system to really, to do yeah. this. So there's a lot of work to do this summer. So the summer is gonna go very, very quickly. Yeah. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna do our best to support them in that work, but there's, yeah. I, I don't disagree with anything you said. It's yeah. just going to be a very I, busy summer. Yeah, I just would be cautious about assuming there's going to be mental health issues. You know, right. I, I just would be cautious because, again, we don't know. We have no data. That's right. So, yeah, and I think, you know, children are very resilient. And I right. think, you know, we we should go in. I think we know there's going to be need for additional services, I would say. And 
the tail of this emergency because it's not over will be long. I mean, so it's not like we're going to jump in in September and fix everything from the spring. Goal one is to get the school systems back open so we can begin to introduce stability. But this this will take a while to work its way through. I will say, just to put in a plug for a new idea, um, I've been increasingly convinced uh, in the last 36 hours, maybe 48 hours, that we should have a uniform school calendar for next year. Um, I, 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 I introduced that concept. I understand it's late in the session. It would require action of the General Assembly. Um, but I've increased, you know, I've, I've become convinced that we need to have a statewide school calendar to manage uh, some of these issues. So I'd, I'd welcome your support. And what I, what I think I could draft language to that effect if people are interested in it. But basically, it would be something to the effect to give the Secretary of Education the ability to establish a statewide school calendar in consultation with the usual partner agents, organizations, and also to say that school would not start earlier than Labor Day. Uh, just to give that additional runway uh, a week or so would be very useful at this point. Uh, but there's a number of issues that have come up in the last couple of days. One, talking with the Secretary of State's office about provisioning the election for the, the year. We have a number of schools that are used as polling places, right. uh, particularly the November election is concerning how we would do that with school being in session. So I think it's going to be necessary to shut down school for a couple of days around election in November. Um, so that's going to require, again, a coordinated response to calendar. I think what we're seeing in the higher education community nationally, the ability to work with vacation time, in particular, a lot of higher ed institutions are leveraging Thanksgiving as sort of an early shutdown time. And then, you know, I think that's, that's going to be very important to consider, particularly if the flu season kicks back in. And, um, you know, I saw this morning that the CDC and others, they're ordering more flu vaccine than normal flu vaccine. So we have to anticipate that the winter is going to be a little more challenging, perhaps, and it would be useful to be able to, um, to, I won't say manipulate, but to use the school calendar to our advantage as a public health strategy, instead of having to do some broader shutdown of schools to really be able to use and to telegraph to parents and communities, kind of here's the schedule. So um, I know it's sort of a late in the session, it's a radical idea, but I would really welcome the opportunity to do that. And I think it's it's going to be an important tool. Um, and it didn't didn't emerge for me earlier because until the health guidance came out, I wasn't really uh -huh. focused on that. But I've I've become convinced it would be very useful. Uh -huh. It would require a change, require a temporary yeah. change in the statutory language to yeah. do that. Especially if COVID returned, you know, it'd be <laughs> nice if you had to shut down school that everybody was shut down Kate, at the same time. So anyway, I'm done. I'm done. Good morning, Kate. Good morning, Larry. Why don't you keep facilitating uh, for now, and then I'll, I'll take over when we move to the next group. How does that sound? Very good. Um, Representative Elder. Thank you, uh, and, and thank you, Secretary, for joining us today. Um, with the passage of, of the budget, uh, uh, I hope it's final iteration out of the House yesterday, um, we've got the CRF um, money heading heading to schools, uh, we hope. And so uh, I'll keep this brief, but I, I'm, I'm just interested to hear from you um, about how we can augment district's capacity to leverage these funds to the fullest extent. I, I think that there's the there's a kind of FY20 coded COVID <laughs> expenses, which to my mind seem like maybe they'll be relatively simple to apply. There are then some um, displacement of previously budgeted funds, which is a I will call just a gray area that I, I don't necessarily need to comment on here, but that I'm thinking about. And then there's the prep um, preparation for next year, including the HVAC money that now is in there. Um, when I brought up that HVAC money at our school, which has just had an extensive HVAC study and has determined we do not need to replace, but we definitely need to clean our HVAC system, which is quite yeah. expensive. We would love to take advantage of this, but we just made the decision. We just can't get the labor in, in 2020 right. to complete. Um, and I said, well, you know, let's check in uh, about that at a later date, kind of with our district, because maybe uh, Efficiency Vermont will be helping with that specific capacity. But, um, you know, th that's on one very specific thing, but just kind of obviously leveraging these federal funds um, and getting every last dollar to some district somewhere is so important. And um, mm -hmm. any way you wanted to comment on, on kind of what, what plans for 
uh, facilitating that, especially for our districts with less administrative capacity, would be really appreciated uh, just to get that update. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I have to, you're, you've been working very rapidly, so I have to get honestly up to speed on what you uh, finally uh, settled on, but the mechanics of it, I'm sure, are pretty much the same. We have, um, I think, an urgent need to get some cash out into districts uh, now, uh, particularly to prepare for reopening and also to maintain continuity of operations for our food service programs. So I think, you know, we'll, we'll endeavor to stand up those uh, systems to, uh, to hand out the CRF funding on a, no doubt, a reimbursement basis uh, as quickly as we can. Uh, we're also working um, on, on turning on the ESSER application. If you remember the ESSER funds, uh, and there's the question there around the equitable shares language that the U.S. Department of Ed uh, sort of introduced some ambiguity, shall we say, about how, to, how those funds should be also shared with uh, private schools. Um, we're very close to turning on that application. So we expect that application to be on within the week and uh, folks will be able to pull down those funds after July 1 as well. So uh, we'll have the basic mechanisms all in play to bring the funds into focus. The guidance is out there. So uh, that the guidance also includes a section on HVAC. So um, I think they'll have the basic nuts and bolts to begin to start to uh, address the reopening costs, if you will. I'm sure they'll surface additional costs, but the immediate need is sort of like liquidity and maintaining uh, an infusion of you know, cash so they can continue on their operational work. Um, and we'll certainly pursue the FY20 uh, modeling that we were doing relative to payroll, um, which we think is uh, qualifies for CRF. Uh, we had pegged that somewhere around $16 million. So we have that on the coding ability to do that. So we'll, we'll do that on the back end. But yeah, I think, you know, as soon as the budget's uh, signed and uh, enacted, then we'll, we'll move forward very rapidly, probably after the 4th of July to uh, work with business managers to turn, turn that on as quickly as possible. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, uh, you know, how districts we have, you know, people I think are very early phases of digesting uh, the, the health guidance and particularly its impact on the physical plant. Uh, there, uh, we're doing a statewide call today with Department of Health and superintendents to literally walk through the guidance in more detail. So I think, you know, as it's early, but I think folks, as it sinks in a little bit as to what's in there, um, we'll start to uh, understand the priorities from a fiscal standpoint that districts are looking at to uh, safely reopen schools. Um, Representative James, did you have a question? I saw your hand up. It did go up, it's been answered, thank you. Oh, okay, very good, very good. Do we have any more questions for the secretary? Larry? I, I do, I do appreciate ahead. that update, thank you. Go ahead, Rep. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have an ability to raise my hand because I'm a, a co-host, so <laughs> I'll just speak up. Um, there was some, you had some uh, information, I think on literacy, I don't know if I, you spoke to that uh, before I arrived but you had some thoughts on literacy and Act 173. He, yeah, he did speak he to did. that. Okay, I'll watch yes. that later. So, so never mind. Yes. thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, I, it just, I think as part of our overall intervention, it's still very much on the table for us. Um, but I mean, the, the larger point, uh, which we, we, we discussed is sort of my, my sort of recognition that from a messaging standpoint, uh, reopening school, is the primary intervention on the table right now that we need to do and focus on doing successfully. That's the most, the best thing we can do right now. So we need to really put our efforts into uh, doing that successfully. Thank you for that focus. Um, I, I appreciate that focus. We are gonna hear from the field now um, on how things are going. Uh, very much appreciate um, your visiting with us today. This may be our last meeting in June, I'm not sure. Um, the the uh, CRF recommendations that were in the bill yesterday, 961, are now in the Senate. I'm expecting that we'll hear something today on how that's all being changed. <laughs> so uh, don't anybody get too attached to anything. <laughs> it's still in, everything's still up in the air. Um, so I think what we can do at this point is thank the secretary and thank you so much, uh, Representative Cooperly. And please stay with us, Secretary French, if, if you 
if you can, and if, if you can't, we understand. Yes, I have another 30 minutes, so I'll stay through 9.30. Great. Okay, um, shall we start with the superintendents? We're looking to Good hear- Good morning, Miss. Yeah, please, and Good update. morning. Is the audio okay? Everybody okay. got that? Audio's good. Okay, so I'm gonna ask Avery if she would post a word cloud document that I'm gonna explain briefly, um, and then I'm gonna give you a few comments. While she posts that, I wanna just acknowledge that um, I really appreciated Dan's explanation of where we are. It was as good a summation, I think, of um, where we are point in time and where we need to be, um, as I've heard in recent days. Uh, I agree with him entirely that opening schools is the, um, the, the, the principal or primary intervention that we can undertake right now. Um, in preparation for today, um, because I serve as a conduit uh, of the voice of superintendents to the General Assembly, I sent a note to 15 superintendents and I asked them on June 24th, what was occupying their minds? What were they thinking about? And I asked them to spend three to five minutes each in crafting a response. I told them that I would not um, use personally identifiable information because I wanted them to be very, very candid. And instead of getting what I think are three to five minutes of comments from each of them, I got paragraphs. And I was so impressed by the contributions that they made and their thought processes that I decided to take um, all of the text that was provided to me. And I had 13 out of 15 respond from all across the state, all different types of systems. And I put it into a word cloud. Um, I think everyone is familiar with a word cloud, but what a word cloud does is it emphasizes the words that are most commonly used, both in terms of organization and prominence of display. So in this case, I think we could say not only is a picture worth a thousand words, in this case, a picture is a thousand words. But if you focus on the center of the, of the cloud, top to bottom, you'll see that the most prominent feature was students, which is both understandable and I think satisfying to those that are, are interested in observing the public education systems response. And then the, the diagram actually speaks for itself, but you'll see that all of the things that you've been speaking about um, were featured in terms of the responses that came from superintendents. So what I'm gonna do now is briefly give you some of the actual um, uh, narrative that was provided to me, because I think it's illustrative, both of the work that's being accomplished the challenges we face, and the fact that I think Dan's characterization of what needs to be done and how it needs to be done is, is absolutely on point. Um, before I give you a few of those select quotes, I just wanna say that um, in my observation, and I think this is largely agreed to, we cannot diminish the magnitudes of the effects of this crisis. And while our tendency is to focus on a specific, specific task or obligation, the magnitude really is navigating the logistical, the emotional, and the operational challenges, not only for schools and public education, but for the place of schools and public education um, in what I would describe generally as a societal response. So now what I'm going to do, and I will do it succinctly, is I'm going to give you verbatim some of the quotes that I received from these 13 superintendents. And in the middle of my review of this last night, I sent Kate a text, which she probably thought was, well, where did this come from? Um, and Kate, I apologize for not responding. I asked her if the House Education Committee would have the ability to meet in the interim between the close of the current session and the, and the reconvening in August. And my reason for asking was, 
when I reviewed what the superintendent had to say, I it occurred to me that a check-in might might be very much in order. Um, and the check-in could could not only understand um, the actions of the agency in the field, but it will help with course adjustments that the General Assembly could contribute to or assistance that the General Assembly might provide in terms of um, things that you would address when you come back in, in, in August. So with that, I'm going to slowly but deliberately um, share with you some of the quotes that came from these 13 superintendents. And I'll start now. Um, so the first was, I am wondering about our budgets for the year and how we will navigate the unanticipated costs associated with COVID-19. There are definitely more than I could have imagined even a month ago. How will the COVID relief money be distributed and when will we know? The second quote, I am thinking about the added urgency that now exists in the equity work that we had already begun. I am thinking about how important it is to continue to learn and grow as a leader in order to be best equipped to dismantle systems and structures that marginalize people of color. Third, I am thinking about my students and I'm wondering if they are safe and healthy. I'm wondering about their mental health needs. How will they respond to returning to an in-person learning environment in general? Four, I am thinking about the continuation of our summer feeding programs and how happy I am that we have been able to continue the delivery portion of our system. Five, I am thinking about our summer program and hoping it was the right decision to allow some in-person opportunities, given how restrictive the guidance is, how much added cleaning it will be for custodians, and how much work they have to do to ensure buildings are prepared for reoccupancy. Next, I have been thinking that we have never worked more collaboratively as leaders both within our systems and throughout our region and state. We are holding each other up and sharing our best and most promising thinking and practices. Doing this work alone is not a place for any of us to be. We need each other to be able to get through this. Next, given the many guidelines and requirements moving forward, is it truly possible that we can open schools? Where will the finances come to meet the requirements? Can we still have an option of remote learning for those who can't or will not send their children to school? Is the six foot rule a recommendation or a requirement? Next, what happens to finances if a significant percentage of people choose to homeschool their children. Next, equity is a huge problem in the best of times. It is insurmountable in present times. There's then another comment about budgetary challenges. This particular superintendent does not have a budget and is concerned both about not having a budget and the costs associated with COVID. The next comment has to do with what school will look like in the fall and what in particular are, are the implications for students who already have a history of trauma in their lives. The next per person or the next quote centered on what was believed to be inconsistencies, even in what I would add parenthetically is good and evolving guidance from the AOE and health department, which, which school leaders have participated in. But the, the concern was um, 
inconsistencies in the guidance, and then followed by this quote, I am concerned about the number of areas that are recommended versus required. This leaves room for local decision-making, which normally I would be in favor of. But in this case, I believe it will create great differences between districts, and we are at risk for tremendous disagreement with the unions. The next comment goes to um, the, the fact that the NEA had announced this week that it asked for a task force or a commission on the reopening of schools. Um, and, and really that speaks to what I would, what I would characterize as the legitimate concerns for labor and the need for management to respond. So while I think we have a, a harmonious um, collaboration right now, and this is, these are my words, these were not in the quotes that came to me, the potential for things to sort of go off the rails in that regard based on um, disagreement is very real. And it hasn't occurred so far, but I think folks that understand uh, labor management relationships hope for collaboration. But when decisions don't, um, when people aren't in agreement, the potential is for, for um, a disruption in, in the progress, um, small p, uh, toward the reopening of schools. Um, and then, and then somebody commented, um, I continue to be worried about putting my staff and students at risk by bringing them back. As superintendent, I feel ultimately responsible for the safety of all stakeholders. Uh, the next comment also went to concerns about both academic and social emotional well being. Um, the next comment went to concerns about not knowing how the money is going to work. Um, the next comment went to um, an, an understanding that um, families feel destabilized given the crisis and the implications of the, of the crisis, and that individual families are contemplating not only how the system will respond, but how they as families will respond and that manifests itself into, and I'll use the quote here, many parents do not want to send their children to school or they want options, AKA pick and choose. They want to know, will there be a homeschooling option available to anyone across the state or will the school provide us with remote learning if we do not want to attend in person? The next quote was, I have never encountered such fragility among staff. Another comment about budgetary uncertainty. And then finally, and I'll add, these are really just representative of the theme of the com comments that I received back in general. Um, and then finally, somebody wrote, um, my community board and my community and school board is pushing back on the reopening of school guidance. They are questioning the state's authority to make masks mandatory among other requirements. In some cases, I'm being asked to ignore um, state requirements. We have a community that is quite upset that they aren't making all these decisions locally. Um, I, and, and again, there were dozens of um, comments that I could have selected. Those were representative. And to me, it speaks to the the big challenge we face, the need we, that we have to work together, and again the the in total the logistical, emotional, and operational challenges that we face. Uh, I think that words really can't do justice to the challenge, but I do think that the fact that um, we are all doing this together, we need to continue doing it together and just do the best we can. So. I'll close by saying I, I'm confident that everybody's doing the best we can. I've, I've really, both personally and professionally, um, expanded the, the tremendous work uh, with colleagues, and I'm really appreciative of that. And, you know, it's a, it's a challenge that we all have to rise to the occasion on, but I, I wanted to let you know what was on the mind of superintendents as of 3.30 p.m. yesterday afternoon. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much, Jeff. Avery, if you could bring the screen back.
Um, I'd like to go to the principals next, and then we'll do the teachers. Good morning, everybody. Um, did all everything that Jeff just shared. Principals are feeling, feeling the, many of the same feelings, obviously. I'll just share a few notes with you. Um, Kate asked yesterday, asked Kate and Larry asked me yesterday, things that we learned. And I think some of the things that we learned are the importance of in-person instruction. Um, that can't be replaced by remote learning. These kids didn't sign up for remote learning. It's not like taking a college class when you're an expert in technology. We also learned uh, the resource for the major inequities we have as a state, broadband being one example of those, but just the dynamics at home for some kids make it impossible to learn the same way other kids might be able to. You heard yesterday from Patrick Halliday from the AOE, he mentioned his own example, and I sent him an email afterwards saying, I thought that really, in response to Sarita's question, really drove home the point that kids are in different places. School is supposed to be a great equalizer. When the kids are not at school, we lose that opportunity. Um, we also learned once again, how incredibly important our schools are to society not only as academic institutions, but in terms of mental and physical health supports for the children themselves of the state. And they're a critical factor in our economy. Uh, most families have both parents working and parents can't work with kids at home, especially with younger kids. Going forward, uh, some of the concerns that we have as principals are, are staffing concerns that have already been talked about. Some national surveys are predicting that 25% of school employees may not return this fall. Uh, it's not just teachers, that's support staff, uh, audience, whatever. I'm hoping that number is a lot smaller in Vermont. We're concerned about academic regression, uh, especially in mathematics and literacy. And one of the things that I actually brought up in, in my, our meeting yesterday, and I've been bringing it up wherever I can, is I think one of the ways to address the academic issue is through high quality tutoring in the class where we do get retired teachers like Sarita and, and uh, you know, Representative Webb to come out of retirement, jump in classrooms and help out some, where the regular teacher is teaching a literacy lesson and then kids are getting small support by trained people, uh, college graduates that aren't necessarily trained, they're just they're the volunteers or paid, paid an hourly rate and use COVID funding for that. I think that's gonna be, I think that's really critical. I totally agree with Dan though, that that's, a September initiative. That's not an August initiative. Um, I also agree that, and you, you've all heard me talk about statewide calendar. I totally believe in the statewide calendar. I think we should have done that 25 years ago. I wouldn't necessarily start it after Labor Day, though, because I'm worried about Thanksgiving time, maybe there being an uptick um, after spending time on this guidance workforce, listening to the doctors on that committee. I think I think Tracy Sawyers and I are the only two that were on that, on that group that wrote, wrote the guidance document. Uh, that we submitted to Dan and to Dr. Levine, I'm concerned about there being uptakes and we may have to shut down some during the winter to go remote. So I'd like to see us get as many days in as we can in person, even if it's just to start the normal routine. As soon as we get kids back in school and, and learning routines, totally agree with the secretary, that's what we should do. Um, Sarita mentioned assessments. I think that what we were looking at will be low stakes baseline assessments, just to kind of check in where kids are at, not necessarily a standardized test, and just, uh, okay, where are the holes that we need to help kids plug? And that's where I see tutors and, and people like that trying to help with that. Right now, uh, principals are planning, uh, using the public health guidance that was submitted, they're planning for hybrid instruction. They're planning for trying to open schools at a stage two level, hoping to go to stage three. The hope behind that would be within a couple weeks, we would move to stage three. The idea of starting at stage two is simply so that we can see how we can do it to make sure that if we have to drop back to stage two where maybe in some schools only half the kids are actually physically present. A big factor will be the number of students in a school, the amount of physical space that they have and what resources they have. How this will look at Leland Gray High School is different than how it will look at CBU High School just because of the number of students. So when we're in stage two, there's gonna be a lot of on the ground problem solving by principals, leadership teams with support from central office. When we're in stage three, that'll be much more close to normal school, obviously with lots of extra health protections in place. Uh, and then the only, the only other thing I wanted to add was, um, Dan had mentioned routines, and I just wanna stress that. Routines, return to as much normalcy as we can are gonna be critical for students and staff. And uh, he mentioned reopening school is the main intervention. And until he said that, that really, I mean, I've been thinking that's the number one thing we need to do, obviously. 
But I think he's right. I think that is the main invention, intervention, getting the kids back to school, getting them in, into a routine, and then we can see where they're academically. I'm less concerned about academics than I am that sense of belonging. I don't know if this committee has talked to Dave Melnick, but <clears throat> one of the things he shared um, is that he's worried about the students, many students having a sense of abandonment. Um, and maybe subconsciously, because school was the one real safe place they had for meals, for support, for adult attention and love. For many kids, they don't necessarily get that at home. And he's feeling like some of them may unconsciously feel like they kind of were abandoned. March 12th, March 13th, whatever, boom, school's done. See you sometime. And so there's work to be done there. It's going to be about relationships, relationships, and relationships the first six weeks. And that's really all I, I need to say. Everything else has been said. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jay. I'm not sure who's speaking for the Vermont NEA. Is it is it Don? Yes, Don Tenney. Thank you. Here, English teacher from South Arrow, for the record, uh, president of Vermont NEA. I appreciate the opportunity to, to join this conversation. Um, and while Secretary French is here, I want to also express our appreciation to uh, him joining us, as he mentioned, uh, at a meeting of our our statewide task force, I think it indicates the importance of, of ongoing dialogue uh, amongst all the stakeholders as, as we face these, uh, these complex issues. Um, and I also wanna thank you for your continued support and all the meetings that you have, have been engaged with since the pandemic has hit um, throughout the spring. Um, so we did create a statewide task force uh, of our own, about two dozen members, uh, including bus driver, uh, school nurse, other, another nurse who actually teaches allied health, paraeducators and teachers. And their, um, their job is to essentially assess the situation within their local districts and report back to Vermont NEA leadership and staff to see what we can do to support them at the local level, as well as pass along information uh, to, the, to the agency. Um, it's really, for us, it's a, it's a way for us to gather data uh, locally and, and as been mentioned um, most recently we've called upon the AOE to create a, uh, what we're calling a statewide planning commission um, which includes obviously members of our union um, school employees of various types food service workers custodians bus drivers paraeducators administrators and assistants um, but it also definitely includes, you know, administration, school board members, families, and, and citizens, and the general public. It's it's not um, it's not just the union working with the AOE by any stretch. Um, and we really strongly see the the ne absolute necessity for collaboration. As a matter of fact, at 10 a.m. this morning, I'm zooming down to Rutgers for a conference on labor management collaboration sponsored by the New Jersey School Boards Association and our Education Association. So we really do need to continue this work. And you've heard me say that before um, when I'm talking about uh, creating safe, compassionate learning environments and dealing with issues of trauma. Um, so our, our members, and this has been mentioned before, really see the need for clear, consistent, uniform guidance from the state to, to the local schools. Um, we really appreciate all the hard work that went into the writing of a strong, healthy start, which are the state guidelines on health and safety. It really is a good roadmap, um, but you know, we're looking for more, some more specific details um specific requirements you know and you folks and it's been mentioned before you often hear the phrase local control uh, when it comes to any policy decision um, we feel though that there's some serious health and safety practices that cannot be left up just to local folks making decisions in the local districts so what we're asking for uh, is a is a mechanism that will interpret the health and safety guidelines to allow for the real effective implementation of those guidelines and to make sure the resources particularly will be available for that effective implementation. Um, and so, you know, we, one of the reasons we believe that Vermont public schools are often rated in the top five in the nation is because of the autonomy our local districts have and our classroom teachers have. Um, and it seems sort of 
counterintuitive to ask to let go of some of that autonomy autonomy when making these very difficult decisions. Um, but we have to make sure that that we get the 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 medical science right and and that requires that we have that connection with the Department of Health. And it also requires the school bus drivers, for instance, the custodians, the paraeducators, to have their voice in that to say, wait a minute, how would that work in this situation, right? So, um, and, and we know that the need for that well-coordinated specific, you know, floor of expectations um, we've seen the extreme example when that's not there at the, at the federal level, uh, federal government letting the you know, governors fend for themselves. So we, and that's a, a, not a comparison, just an extreme example. Um, you, as has been mentioned before, we know that the student needs, particularly in the area of social emotional well-being, um, will be increasing dramatically over the return to school. Uh, this is particularly true for our black and brown students who have experienced um, just gut-wrenching levels of trauma uh, this year. Um, and so we have, as uh, Jay alluded to, you know, Dave Melnick has done a lot of great work in this area. Uh, he facilitated a series of three webinars uh, for our members, and I'm in. Uh, we're planning also to have Dave facilitate similar webinars for the New England region. We have created a coalition of New England states um, to provide um, more infrastructure, more professional development opportunities to focus on um, the issues of trauma. Because <clears throat> we just want to remind folks that we've been dealing with this. Uh, issue for a number of years now, and I've spoken to this committee about the challenges that our students face and the various issues around behavior um, in, our, in our public schools before uh, the pandemic hit. Those, all those issues and, and trying to meet students' needs um, did not go away. So we have to some, be prepared for that. I absolutely agree. The opening of schools is a, is is probably one of the better interventions, and we're, but we also have to make sure that we are taking a, a true trauma sensitive approach um, to best meet the needs of of all our students. Um, and you know, I think as as Secretary French talked about, as did Jay, the um, the need for flexibility in the calendar. Uh, we're very concerned that August 26 is going to be here before we're ready. So we have to be able to make sure that we have the appropriate resources uh, in place. Um, we will continue to argue for the continued suspension of all statewide standardized testing. Our national organization will continue to make that argument with the Federal Department of Education. Uh, now is not the time to test our students. Uh, as Jay said, now is the time to build and rebuild the relationships that they have with their, their fellow students and with educators. Um, if, if I were the emperor instead of a union president, I would forbid the distribution of a single syllabus at the start of the school year. Um, we must take the time uh, to learn about our students as human beings first and to listen to our students' stories uh, which will be how they continue to make meaning of their experience in isolation in the last few months uh, and articulate their connections to the communities. Um, we often speak about schools as learning communities. Now we have to talk about schools as healing communities. Uh, so as we get to know our students, we will discover their interests and their personal and academic strengths upon which we can build really hoping we can avoid the deficit model that would lead to excessive testing to identify weaknesses and gaps. So all assessments need to be kept informal, need to be formative. So we know we're not returning to normal. The challenges are complex and it's easy to be overwhelmed. And I, and I hope your committee will, con will be able to continue to provide the oversight of our public school system which will most likely include reports from the field and from the AOE. So with those regular check-ins, we're hopeful that the needs for resources 
and perhaps pub public policy changes can be identified early. And just one more, uh, one more point I'd like to make around hybrid learning concerns. Um, we, we agree that a sort of a blended approach will work, but we have to be very careful what that means because we, we, can't, we can't be doing two things at once, right? So it's some people have said, well, you're gonna have some students in the classroom, some students at home. Well, what does that, what does that mean for that classroom teacher? Are they, main, are they teaching their class in the physical space at the same time they're managing an online course or students at home? Right, there's only there's only one one person there. So um, we know that our members, and we've talked about this in previous meetings, were overwhelmed with the distance learning. We have many teachers up 10:30, 11 30 at night trying to record things so that they're ready for the next morning, phone calls from parents at any given time of the day. Uh, and so we have to we have to refine that approach. But, but we must be very cautious as we move towards a, an expectation of what hybrid learning means. My view of hybrid learning would right now would be have a staggered schedule, students physically there on Monday, then they're at home Tuesday, another group is there on Tuesday, home Wednesday, but you're, you're giving assignments and things when they're in the room doing the work at home. It's not a case of running two separate courses. So I just wanna, um, just want to be clear about that piece. Um, so uh, I'd be happy to answer uh, any questions at all. Thank you. I'm going to, given our time that we have to leave in, in a little less than half an hour, I'm going to go right to um, the, uh, the special ed administrators with Tracy, and then we'll go to the school boards. And um, I so appreciate hearing from you. This is a really important conversation for us. Tracy, thank you. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Um, so again, Tracy Sawyer is executive director of the Vermont Council of Special Education Administrators. And I agree with much of what's already been said. And I just really appreciate the committee for inviting us so often um, and all your very hard work over these last months. You know, as I reflect back, there's just been such a tremendous amount of work that's taken place and it wasn't perfect, but you know, schools pivoted and so there are some positives to build on. Um, I agree that collaboration has been key. It's really been outstanding. We specifically appreciated AOE's regular um, legal team collaboration um, with VCSC banks that my members needed. Uh, that made a huge difference and none of us can figure this out on its own. And it's been critical to be as consistent as possible. Um, I do believe as we all agree, it's gonna even get harder in the fall um, BCSEA members, as I've talked to you about before, are concerned about the amount of service that's about to be requested by parents regarding the COVID-19 impact on IEP goals and just the sheer number of evaluations that will be requested. It's going to take additional resources and work, and it's just going to be a lot to figure this out because it's not realistic for kids to be in classes or receiving education 10 to 12 hours a day, but there's going to be great need. Um, and we are also very worried about the social emotional needs of students as schools reopen. Um, this is gonna have to be addressed before academic learning could happen. I know others have talked about this this morning, but more specifically, some of the things um, I've been thinking about in my members is that really needs to be a focus on around social emotional re-entry and then shorter recovery and then longer term recovery for these kids. Um, multi multidisciplinary teams with school nurses school employed mental health professionals and teachers are gonna be key. The need for access to school employed mental health professionals, so school psychologists, school counselors and school social workers and school nurses has never been higher. And I keep thinking about, um, you know, the elevated role of school nurses and that, you know, some schools don't have school nurses. So it's gonna be a really important position. I think social emotional screening is for kids for sure, but I think trying to think about other kinds of check-ins with all students, um, plus having a process to identify students of high risk of significant stress or trauma from COVID-19 is gonna be important. Um, kids are not gonna be bringing up these issues um, directly on their own in most cases. I think it's gonna be 
critical to teach and reteach expectations and routines. And people have talked about that this morning and really avoid punitive approaches. So, you know, whether it's scripts or at least talking points, just consistency and reassuring messages are gonna be critical. I think the social emotional learning curriculum needs to be intentionally embedded into the core academic subjects. Like all of us, I'm concerned about attendance drops. So either through school refusal, um, kids that are medically fragile, or just kids are gonna be missing a lot more days because of the stricter health guidance and thinks there needs to be a formal plan to have mental health professionals check in, plans for individuals who are immune compromised or otherwise at risk, including those with family members that might be testing for um, positive for COVID-19 students with health problems or physical disabilities, um, individuals with respiratory problems. We also need to um, involve the school nurse in this area too, but it's an area we think a lot about. I think we're concerned definitely around um, stigma for not wearing a mask if it's not possible. We strongly supported um, the guidance to say that masks were required, but some kids just aren't gonna be able to do it. So that's gonna be a issue that we're gonna have to see um, how that develops you know, related to social emotional, I think the loss of things like choir and performances and those kinds of things um, that can't be, that can't take place because of the health guidelines. It's important to acknowledge the potential loss experienced by students because those things contribute to their sense of self. So I think that's going to be an issue. Um, again, as Jay said uh, on this call, he and I were on the task force around um, the health guidance. And I think, um, bolstering the process of welcoming each day um, is gonna be critical. It's gonna be very different with temperature checks, everybody in masks. It's gonna be a whole new and scarier way to have to come to school. Um, so I think that's just gonna be critical to figure out um, how kids can feel um, welcomed in that environment. I think behaviors um, need to be viewed through a trauma-informed lens as a potential symptom of deficits and regulatory school skills and a prolonged adjustment period that's going to be very important. Um, we've talked about this, but addressing staff needs has got to be part of this. Um, Self-care must be part of the school culture. Um, that's really important. Kids and um, staff are going to have, you know, issues to, that we need to pay attention to coming back. I think family engagement is critical. There's been, you know, Parents are gonna have a lot of concerns and fears potentially. And we've changed our relationship with families and communities by virtue of going into their living space. And that's one of the positives um, that's come out of this. So schools need to capitalize on this and continue to move forward. I think we should consider offering family education on specific strategies they could use to help support successful reentry if possible and information on how to seek support if they have specific concerns about their child. Um, one of the biggest issues is the uncertainty, obviously, about how schools will look and continue to look, and this is very uncomfortable for all of us. We need to address the unpredictable um, and evolving context and guidance and clearly communicate decision points for additional school closures and plans to support students in academic, social, emotional, and mental health and behavioral health in the event of school closure. And I think the last thing I'd say is that I I do worry a lot about the lack of engagement and distance learning um, after schools closed um, this spring, that it could maybe a warning sign of homelessness. And I think there'll definitely be an increase in homelessness because of the economic crisis. And there needs to be systems in place to identify returning McKinney Vento students as well as students who are newly experiencing homelessness. So I think that's gonna be an issue as we think about vulnerable students. So I think that's just some more of the specific thinking um, that we have around the social emotional. That's really a, that point of re-entry um, is really important um, and on our minds as well. You're muted. Thank you so much, Tracy. Um, I wanted to turn now to the school boards. We need to leave at 940, so it's probably limited time for questions for us, but I think that it's certainly wonderful to hear from you all. So is that um, Sue or Sandra? Yes. Sue? Good morning, Sue Siglowski, Vermont School Boards Association. I'd like to thank the committee for being willing to spend the time needed to understand all of these complex issues that you're hearing about this morning and hope you're all able to take a much deserved break during the month of July. 
going to give you a short update on school board work focusing on three areas, policy work, equity, and school budgets. Um, last week, as you've heard, the uh, Department of Health and the Agency of Education issued a strong and healthy start, which is the guidance that everyone's been talking about this morning. We are looking closely at that guidance so that we can help school boards understand what their role is in ensuring a strong and healthy start for school in the fall. And as Secretary French mentioned, we're meeting with him uh, next week on that topic. Uh, in policy work, one of the duties of school boards is to adopt policies which set direction and provide oversight on behalf of the community and they provide guidance for all of the um, different uh, people within a school. There may mean, need to be some temporary changes to existing policies in order to follow the health guidance that was issued last week regarding reopening schools. And we are working right now to identify those policies and communicate any issues to school board members. Um, typically boards will have policies on community use of school facilities, visits by parents and community members, field trips, transportation, um, sometimes dress codes. So all of those are gonna need to be um, looked at. Additionally, there may be a need for some new policies as schools open for in-person instruction. Um, I wanted to let you know about a new policy, model policy that's being posted to VSBA's website this morning and sent out to school board members covering electronic communications between school employees and students. School boards will be adopting this policy over the summer and maintaining it for future years due to the possibility of returning to remote learning if the pandemic worsens and also the possibility of some kind of hybrid learning situation it is more important than ever to have a policy in place that addresses electronic communication between school employees and students moving forward. In addition, VSBA is working on a model equity policy, which is slated to be ready for release in July. Um, in early June, the VSBA along with the VSA and VPA issued a statement strongly condemning systemic violence and oppression that has been put upon black indigenous and people of color in our country. And uh, we recognize that public education in Vermont is not immune to systemic oppression and racism and um, the need to do more to advance this work beyond the model equity policy. So um, in addition to committing our own employees to participating in ongoing implicit bias, equity and diversity training, we will also be promoting and supporting um, implicit bias training for all faculty and staff in Vermont public schools. And in connection with this, we would like to talk with your committee about H714 um, when you return in August, if, um, if you're able to uh, spend time on that. Uh, school board budgets for those school districts which have an approved budget for FY21, those school boards are already starting to plan for budgeting in the uncertain fiscal environment of FY22. They will be developing projections and cost saving measures and communicating to the community what is known, what is unknown, and they're going to be starting earlier than usual to develop those FY22 budgets and in order to take the time that's needed to do that. Um, those school districts that do not have an approved budget yet for FY21 are still focused on that immediate issue. Overall, I um, would say that there is great uncertainty about the costs associated with reopening schools to in-person instruction and whether those federal relief funds will adequately assist schools in covering those costs. And we expect that we would be returning to this topic when you return in August. We wanted to let you know that the VSBA and VSA are hosting a remote conference on July 21st and 22nd with a session focusing on fiscal forecasts and difficult budgeting conversations in this new era that we're in. Overall, the conference is focusing on the impact of COVID-19 and racism on public education in Vermont. This conference, um, which is gonna be replacing our fall conference, will provide relevant, timely, and actionable information to districts as they plan to reopen schools. And the VSBA and VSA will be sending all of um, you committee members an invitation to attend the conference. We really hope that you're able to join us as we think this conference is going to provide important information and context for your legislative work. 
Um, Madam Chair, if there's time, Sandra Cameron from the VSBA has um, some brief comments regarding pre-K. Great, there, there is time. Thank you, Sandra. Certainly, thank you for having me and I will um, shorten what I had prepared. So returning to the topic of pre-K and recalling um, earlier testimony in the session, I want to just organize the thoughts into our core principles that we spoke of earlier around quality, equity, and simplicity. Um, so in terms of quality, we certainly know that children have experienced a period of loss, social emotional disruption, and a wide variation in educational services. And you'll remember Kate Rogers saying that what defines Vermont's universal pre-K education is the implementation of high quality, effective instruction by licensed educators. So the need to have the most skilled educators providing services to students was important before COVID and now it's critical. In terms of equity, COVID exacerbated the equity issues in our schools. Um, the responsibility for pre-K continuity of education to the public schools shifting from a mixed delivery model to the public schools was deliberate, but only temporarily shifted the pre-K education delivery model to a more equitable model. There are no additional resources provided when that shift happened, so some schools with um, capacity um, and resources to make that shift happen. Um, as we move forward, I think um, Reflecting upon analyzing and preparing for the future, should we find ourselves in another state of emergency and or closure? One question is whether private pre-K providers are participating in the work to one, assess children, two, address social emotional needs, and three, prepare for a hybrid education delivery model. And if not, we may find ourselves per perpetuating a situation of high reliance on support from public schools. The limited provision of the pre-K hours will in fact result in children spending their day in multiple locations, which goes against all guidance at this point. In terms of simplicity, the services from private programs um, that then transitioned, um, the communication for families, that was quite difficult for them, going from a private program to a public program mid-year. Um, we also heard from the field that the guidance was often delayed um, as things were evolving because of the need to be vetted by both agencies. Some of the suggestions in the AOE guidance that are out now contradict with CDD licensing and um, their current guidance, which makes the compliance of the CDD rules more challenging, resulting in school leaders being able to comply with both. In fact, I had a colleague provide me with a side-by-side -side comparison yesterday, a multi-page side-by-side of them trying to navigate how they're going to implement both. Um, and I have examples, but I don't think we have time. So economic crisis, crisis is far from over and the efficacy and sustainability of all programs may soon be under analysis. Thank you for the opportunity to return to the important conversation and thank you for your work you've done this session. Thank you so much. Um, we have 10 minutes for some questions. Um, I am seeing Sarita, is that a new hand? I, that's, yes, that is Sarita. I probably should just keep it up. No, no. <laughs> um, I wanted to just say to Sandra, thank you so much for the journal uh, that you put together, the report, um, as I really find that extremely helpful. So I just wanted to say thanks yeah. for doing that. And I just wanted to ask um, Dawn um, about, kind of the balance between assessment and social emotional needs. Because again, I think like we all agreed, what's best for kids is to get back into a routine, which, you know, I think of schools as a cognitive system. I mean, certainly there's emotion in there, but the teachers- Sarita, are Sarita time, focus the question. Yeah, okay. So I'm just wondering how we know as the public you know, as legislators, how students are performing if we don't have data, some data. I, th I think that's important to know, but I don't think that's where that's where we begin. I, we should right. not begin there. And and one of the one of the reasons um, to focus on storytelling, for instance, and, and this is 
directly from Dave Melnick's uh, work with us. If, if working on storytelling provides the if provides every teacher and every paraeducator working with the student to identify um, some literacy issues within that student, but it's done organically and it comes from a place of the students telling their stories uh, and, and done in, in a more organic way. I, I think we definitely eventually would need to, to find out where, where the quote unquote um, unfinished learning is. Mm -hmm. um, but right now is not the time to, to focus on data and particularly data that assesses the, the district as a whole, which is much yeah. of what standardized testing does. Yeah. But to be, yeah. be purely student centered. Right. Um, and, and, the, and the other problem with the testing is that the message, as you know this, the message to the child is, we really just care about you as a, as a learner or as a test score, as a data yeah. point, instead yeah. of, I wanna know you. No, and no. Here's one way to do that. Yeah, no, I love the storytelling because I, I think teachers are the best um, observers of when a child is not learning, when not, they're not, and that's data to me. You know, when they're telling a story and they right. can't, whatever, that's the data, you know, that I'm looking for, you know, and, and I, I know teachers are really good at that. Right, but we're not going to have that data to be able to, you know, to publish the graphs right. and and and, right. and all that in, in the local newspaper. Yeah, but it's real data for the educators to be able to best meet meet the needs of those students. Yeah, thank you. Other questions, Donna. That quick one to you. You met, you mentioned something about a um, um the the guidance coming forward. Uh, the, the concept of the challenge between um, health and safety needing to be broad and consistent um, and the concern about local control. You said something about a, um, needing a mechanism to interpret this guidance. And if you have ideas on that, I'm sure that folks would be interested in. Right, so that's what, I mean, our proposal is a statewide planning commission to do that. And it's that not not to create a whole different level of bureaucracy, but to, to have a mechanism to bring school board members, superintendents, principals, teachers, paraeducators, custodians, to look at very specific practices which are going to have to be performed locally, um, and how do we make sure those practices are following those health and safety guidelines? Because, in, as you know, in, in the guidelines, it's, there are things like whenever possible or where feasible. Well, how, how do we how do we get around that? Sort of leaving it to to local interpretation on everything like that. So that's what we're um, thinking about. Like we have the 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 um, one example right now that there are many questions about is this is the preschool screening the screen I mean preschool day screening for everyone we see the value and importance of that but what's that going to look like what are what we need a few a finer point on the parameters of that process and who's in a level of responsibility. And that gets real tricky, for instance, when we get into um, what is the expectation of the school bus driver. So we have a school bus driver and our a task force brought at the point. There's no way that he can safely be responsible to be held responsible for screening students as they come onto the bus. And therefore, we need another adult monitor on the bus to make sure that that happens in a healthy, in a, in a way that makes sense. Um, so, you know, those are the types of, of uh, questions that, that we have. Thank you. Um, I am going to stop us here. Um, committee, I am not sure when we're going to meet again. <laughs> um, this has been a, a really important conversation. We've had our, we've had our head focused on very, very specific information of late um, and have not been able to pick up our heads to really see what's going on in the field and very much appreciate your, your participation today. Committee, um, we need to be on the floor in five minutes. Um, I will get back to you if I see that we need to um, meet again. I, I just wanna make sure I, Avery is there. Avery, I'm hoping that we'll at least perhaps have one more, more meeting before you head off to law school. Um, but uh, so very, very appreciative of, of your work. 
and keeping us together and moving so what appeared so smoothly into uh, a remote situation with a bunch of us, you know, crazy citizen legislators trying to figure it out as we go along. Um, and your guidance in, in that has been incredibly helpful. Um, getting there. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I miss you. Thanks so much, Avery. Yeah, well, uh, we'll see what, see what we can do to, to pull something together. I'm hoping that you can stick around in August. And, but if you have to go to your, to your, your law school orientation, well, I guess we know where your priorities are. <laughs> I certainly hope so for her sake. <laughs> I do too. So, Avery, um, thank you again. Yeah. Thank yes, you so thank much. you, Avery. Yeah. Thank you guys all. It's been an incredible experience. I've enjoyed it so much. <laughs> it is, it is. Well, you'll be greatly missed. You will.